finance. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Lukowski, an old friend, a former partner, who is really one of the great reporters in the country. She's a partner in Black Florida. Um, she's written three books. Let's see, one's on, on criminal, on um, bankruptcy crime, one's on indentured trustees and defaults, and the other's on mentoring, right? Yes. That's right. I, memor I memorized all myself. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. Yes. Okay. And, um, and Stephanie, <laughs> among the other things she's known for, is known for representing fiduciaries in a number of capacities, um, litigation trustees, chapter 11 trustees, examiners, and um, is also has a particular forte in understanding the cryptocurrency area. Anyway, Stephanie, let me hear you over here. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. I'm Stephanie Wachowski. Welcome to our panel. Our panel is on litigation funding. And I want to, for, before introducing my wonderful panelists, I want to um, spend a couple moments talking about telling you why we chose to do this panel this year. This is the first year that we have presented a panel on this subject, litigation funding, at the Distressed Investment Conference. The reason we felt that this was very timely to do this now is has to do with the state of the art and the state of the industry with respect to litigation finance, which has never been uh, more significant than it is now. I would say that over the course of my practice and particularly over the last perhaps 10 years, litigation funding has grown and evolved tremendously. It is now considered a quite mature industry and a significant alternative asset class. Um, there are several reasons uh, for, several, several ways in which the industry has evolved and grown. Um, one is the amount of money that is invested in litigation funding at this point is an all-time high. Even though the numbers aren't publicly disclosed and are a bit controversial, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. Uh, secondly, uh, since the inception, when there were only a small number of uh, legacy funders, uh, who are also the, uh, including Burford, the market leaders as of today, um, there are also a lot of new entrants into the market, uh, which have diversified the offerings considerably, and now, and, and some of those newer entrants uh, are willing to do smaller deals, take on more risk. And so that has led to, uh, all of those things have led to tremendously more availability of litigation funding in the marketplace. And uh, the, the third thing that has changed over the course of the last few years, or maybe over the last five years, is the kind of transaction that litigation funders are doing has changed and expanded. Um, very significantly, and we're going to talk about that on our panel as well. Um, lastly, I just want to note from the investor side, litigation funding is unique as an alternative asset class for several reasons. Most significantly, it's very high value, and it is also uncorrelated to interest rates in the capital markets. So with that, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce my wonderful panel, um, to my left is Michelle Dreyer of CSC. Um, Michelle is the managing director of CSC. CSC, and, and at the length of capacity, she leads the independent director and restructuring services practice, which includes uh, uh, bankruptcy remote entities, independent directors, distressed directors, litigation and liquidation trustee services, uh, successor and venture trustee services. Um, CSC also handles dispersing agent services, section 3, <coughs> X, escrows, and loan administrative uh, agency services. To Michelle's uh, left is Matthew Dundon. He is a principal and the founder of Dundon Advisors. Uh, Matt has been a leader in global credit litigation and distressed investment for many years. He is by training a corporate finance lawyer, and he's also got a track record uh, prior to his founding Dundon uh, as, an an as an analyst and portfolio manager uh, at seven firms. And then at the end of the table is Connor Murphy, who 
who's the director at Burford Capital. Burford Capital, which I just uh, mentioned in my opening remarks, is a leader in the litigation finance space. Burford provides capital and expertise to businesses and law firms to maximize commercial litigation and arbitration recoveries, uh, minimize risk, and reduce uncertainty. Connor is responsible for originating new business uh, with US law firms and companies or in need of litigation finance. Before joining Burford, Connor served as a managing director at BDO USA and also as general counsel and chief marketing officer at Capstone Advisory. So, um, my first question I'm going to direct to Connor what is litigation funding? Can you define it and explain some of the typical structures? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Stephanie. Um, as you alluded to in your opening remarks, uh, the structures and the opportunity have evolved over time. I've been in the business for about five years. Burford's about 15 years old. Um, it started a long, I mean, our business and, and the industry writ large, you know, kind of grows out of the ashes of the 2008 housing crisis. Um, and there was a need for funding uh, and started uh, as a need to fund straight legal fees and expenses associated with bringing a particular piece of litigation, hence litigation funding. Um, that has evolved over time, and we'll get into this more, um, into other funding uh, mechanisms, which include things like monetizing litigation assets for corporations. Um, litigation for a particular corporation is, in fact, a corporate asset, much like their accounts receivable or their, their other inventory uh, is. And once you look at litigation you know, as an asset, you can apply corporate finance to that asset and unlock, unlock its value through, uh, through our capital. Um, finally, in the strict litigation funding and litigation finance sense, the other thing that, that we do um, is we can purchase claims outright in a, in a purchase and sale transaction. Um, so that's that's our litigation funding business. We have other ancillary businesses, but that's our, our core funding business, and that's what, as we see it, what litigation funding is. So um, this is a question for Matt. Um, what's so special about litigation finance? Um, why is it unique as an investment? So I think as with, with every investment product, you have to think about supply and demand. Uh, on the supply side, it's uh, the, the, the seller, the borrower, everyone about it. It's, it's, a, it's a gear in the engine. Uh, when, you, when you have a lawsuit, you can do four things with it. You can pay lawyers to prosecute it on an hourly basis. You can enter into a contingent a deal with a law firm that will take some significant percentage of, of the recovery, if any. Uh, uh, you can uh, now uh, raise litigation funding uh, to pay the lawyers typically at their hourly rate or some blend of an hourly contingent rate. And the fourth thing you can do is, as Connor would do, is you can, you can sell the uh, lawsuit in whole or part and monetize uh, its sort of some portion or the entire portion of its expected present value. And, and that creates a lot of flexibility for, um, uh, for people who have the responsibility to manage that litigation. And, uh, you know, in, in all cases, uh, you know, the, 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 the market terms for all four of those varieties, with the exception of the first, which paying someone hourly, is that those things are done on a non-recourse basis. Um, and, and people love to prosecute litigation, but it's hard to borrow money uh, or, or issue securities in a way that is limited only to a specific asset. Um, and so that's appealing because you get to pull that out from what would otherwise be your corporate borrowing base, from otherwise you know, what you're going to issue securities on. Um, from the uh, demand side, um, as, uh, as Stephanie has alluded to in your introduction, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, what people look for is alpha. You're, 
you're an investor, you want alpha, which is uncorrelated return, uh, and typically you want that uncorrelated return to be higher than uh, in, in the credit markets, some some credit benchmark, which you might think about if you're a hedge fund. Uh, it might be the S&P 500, it might be the, you know, the return of the single B-rated, you know, corporate uh, credit index. Um, and, and so, and you want those things to be uncorrelated, which is, uh, uh, very important. So that, that creates a demand for high structural return because these, these contracts will, even in low rate environments, you know, the lowest risk litigation funding was was paying into the double digits of expected IRR and, and the highest risk is, you know, paying many multiples of your investment. Uh, now, you know, in a higher rate environment, even the lowest risk litigation funding is, you know, paying in the mid-high teens of the deal that would be done. and, and Clearly, the, the deals for many multiples exist as well. Um, I think that there there tends to be, particularly, I think one of the things that drove demand for litigation finance is that credit alternatives is a market that investment professionals are are heavily heavily with a high constituency of both lawyers and self-trained lawyers in, among uh, among among credit investors. So part of the reason why I think that, that this it has taken off and it has matured is because you had this install base of people who felt that they had a bit of an edge in, in underwriting these risks as well as putting together teams that could more formally underwrite things. And so that created, that was a little spur of additional demand was that it was just sort of a, it was a friendly, rolling lots of meal kind of asset. And, and so now in addition, that meant that in addition to professional full-time litigation investors, like Connor and his colleagues, there was a rich field of, shall we say, part-time litigation investors who feel it was an interesting company to asset to, to portfolio and were willing at certain levels to take the inherent low level of the and 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 that, that is associated with it. Follow up on that, um, you Um, it also does help 
um, maximize recovery. Um, I think because when you're out there and you're engaging counsel uh, who may be more willing to take on maybe some riskier points in the litigation as opposed to settling at a lower price, lower um, settlement amount, uh, you're maximizing the return to not only the beneficiaries um, in the market, but you are you know, creating uh, the ability to really go after the best outcome for uh, your constituents. So, um, let me, uh, following up on a couple points that you made, Michelle, uh, about the choice of counsel being really significant from the standpoint of a trustee's decision um, as to maximize the recovery. Um, Connor, um, can you touch on, I, I mean, I'm interested in your perspective as a funder, how significant is the counsel, the identity of the counsel, and what other factors do you consider as a funder in deciding whether to lend a deal? I, I shouldn't say lend, investment deal. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so a couple of things there. Um, first, you know, with regard to you know fiduciary duties and being a trustee and having an asset, a litigation asset, and, and wanting to, to pursue it and what your options are. Um, I think the default, uh, you know, and which for many years was our biggest competition was like the status quo. What do you do? Right? You call a contingency counsel and and you know hire them to take on the risk, and uh, you're not out of pocket for that, but but that does limit you as to as to who you can, you know, what, what universe of, of lawyers you can tap into is as we know there's there's many, many law firms out there that are, are not interested in that sort of risk. Um, and then the second part of that is um, depending on the economics of a particular uh, piece of litigation or, or basket of litigation, um, litigation funding, although not cheap money, can oftentimes be less expensive than a 40% contingency fee. So I think as um, as fiduciaries, it is incumbent upon you to to run those metrics to see to see what is best. Because if you do go out and seek funding, uh, it does um, it may it may be less expensive, and it does open you up to a, a larger larger universe uh, of counsel. Um, and and if that you know if that latter scenario is the case. Uh, and we're looking at, um, you know, we've been called to, to evaluate the case with the funding. Um, who counsel is, um, is but one of many factors we look at, but certainly um, a very, very important factor. Like, you know, who's, you know, what horse are we going we gonna to ride this case on is, um, is a big deal um, among many, many others. Expensive, risky, long time, counterparty 
of this, etc. Um, so, but, but for you know, for for commercial um, for commercial cases, you know, it's it's you know contracts, um, you know, a lot of antitrust, um, soft IP, which are trade secrets, um, things of that nature. There's there's other areas that present you know challenges. Um, things like construction cases often have counterclaims, and you really can't tell the ounce at the outset. You know who's at fault um, without you know spending some money as to find out what happened uh, and the like. So, but each case is is unique um, and each investment is different. Um, they're customized, they're priced to risk, um, and there's a host of you know as I alluded to earlier, there's a number of things we look at, and there's a number of really good meritorious claims that can and should be bought but are not right for funding. Um, not the least of which is the economics aren't there. There's just simply not enough room, um, you know, for the funders to get their return back, the lawyers to get paid, and most importantly, for the claimant to have you know a reasonable recovery. Um, one example I, I often give is, you know, we really have to consider, you know, where the claimants are head is at in terms of of settlement. Um, in the bankruptcy context, a couple of years ago. Um, I had a case out of Canada, interestingly enough, because we don't see a lot of opportunity um, there, which is a basket of, I, wonder, I don't remember exactly, it was three or five claims um, with an investment ask of something on the order of about $12 million, and in the aggregate about $150 million of damages, which on its face is, is great, uh, what we call headroom. There's enough room in there for us to get our money back, the lawyers to get paid, and, and, and have the claimants to have a meaningful recovery. But at some point during the discussions, um, it came out that they would be more than willing to settle for $30 million, which is a great outcome for them. But if we're putting $12 million in, we're not going to get our return, and the lawyers aren't going to get paid, and then, and then to have a meaningful recovery. So we, it's a deal we couldn't do. And that's where a lot of these deals fall down, is on the economics. Sorry. Uh, Jeff, you personal confession, which is that after last year's distressed investing, where there were parts that some of the speakers were not audible, I insisted on having handheld mics, and then I investigated on YouTube the best handheld mic techniques, and I did this by watching various music videos of live concerts. And I was particularly impressed by, I was particularly impressed by, and you know, when I looked at Karen Moore, you know, she's very good, and, has a you know my heart radio concert on it, but you know she kind of floats in and out in a lot of concerts. So then I was really struck by Janelle Monet, who I have a lot of admiration for, uh, personally and professionally. But I noticed that she has a great uh, technique to hold a microphone, which uh, avoids pitchiness and also makes sure that she's heard. She's a very small person. Uh, that, uh, uh, she's uh, a little bit more of a shrunk than I am, but that's okay. Uh, so uh, to hold the mic in the hand uh, with thumb next to the chin, and I fit, feel like for anybody who's speaking at a later panel and wants to make sure that they're heard, do that. But the downside is that you can drop the mic and, and then and fool yourself. So, okay. So there are a couple more topics that I want to make sure that we cover before the end of the panel. One of them is what the process looks like, but there are two more meaty topics that I'm afraid we won't get to unless we cover them first. So Connor, I'm going to put this last and direct the next question to Michelle, um, which is, we've talked about all the wonderful things that litigation funding can do for a trustee. Uh, what are some of the downsides of litigation funding? Um, well, I think one of the biggest downfalls is, is time. I mean, you have to have time to go out to the market. Um, not all, um, sometimes you're not right into the case early enough to have a lot of time, but, um, you know, it can take six to eight weeks to reach out to funders and, you know, understand their process and get them to a place where they can even make you an offer for funding. So you definitely do need to be able to have time. Um, one positive outshoot, though, of the process that the 
funding companies do is they kind of give you a gut check on on your litigation. Um, as Stephanie talked about earlier, there's a lot of lawyers in the room reviewing your case and also coming back and thinking about, well, how's the chances of success? Um, so if nobody wants to fund you, maybe you need to reconsider your litigation. Um, and then certainly the cost is higher. I mean, this is not a loan. This is a non-recourse investment. Um, so it's priced accordingly. Uh, you're not going to you know, see a 2% return uh, or interest rate on these um, types of investments. So that's certainly something that you need to consider. Um, and to Connor's point earlier, you know, we, need, we need to make sure that there is enough room between the ask and the uh, expected outcome so that everyone makes their, their investment back, the lawyers and other advisors are paid, and your beneficiaries actually do end up with a good recovery. If I can just come make two comments on that. Um, one is that it's, I, I sympathize with a lot of that. I, I see it like lawyers have to, you know, um, what, and frankly the, the claimants, you know, go out to the market for funding, and um, some some things will happen. They'll, they'll sign the term sheet, get locked up for 30 days, 45 days, and, and the deal ends up going south because whoever did the, the diligence on the front end didn't do really any and just put a term sheet out willy-nilly and has really just, just chewed up time. But also what I've seen and heard is that there's no uniformity in the market in terms of if Burford puts out a term sheet, what that nomenclature looks like, investment back plus blah, 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 and others you know, have a different definition of that. And to try to compare apples to apples um, becomes very, very challenging. Um, so that's, that's important. And the other thing I would say in terms of time, spent on it is, you know, if you do approach Burford or another funder for funding, be prepared. Like, like put it, put it, make your case, put a good foot forward, like, be compelling. Because, um, you know, the worst part of my job is, is, you know, telling somebody, no, we're not going to fund your case. Even though, you know, again, we look through it through a different lens than, perhaps continues to counsel, and it might be a great case and can and should be brought, but, it, but it's not, we're not funding for whatever reason. Um, and sometimes we say no because, to the initial point, we just don't feel like the lawyers really grasp the case or have a path to getting a recovery somewhere down the road. Those, those are all very good points. And following up on um, some things that both of you said, um, I think one of the hardest things from a counsel standpoint and, and also from a client standpoint is because there are all these new entrants in the market, you don't know what the specific criteria or kind of deal uh, each of those new lenders or each of those new funders is interested in or what, what is in their, their, uh, uh, their wheelhouse, so to speak. And with the legacy funders, I think that's more well known by the litigators who are involved in bankruptcy litigation, kind of know what a Burford deal is going to look like and what is not going to meet their criteria, so you know, don't even approach them. Um, it's not so clear if you have, for instance, a small deal, it's maybe a $25 million claim and has you know, a certain element of risk, who do you go to? You, there are people in the marketplace who are going to do smaller deals and take on more risk, but trying to sort them out from you know, the, the multitude of uh, emails that you're getting, being bombarded by litigation funders who have had you know, billions of dollars strike <laughs> out for 10 minutes and need to invest it, it's very hard to sort out. And I think that it would be a lot, it's very beneficial, and I have two suggestions. One is I think that if you're looking for litigation funding, having a lawyer that deals with it a lot and is familiar with what's in the market is helpful. But even more helpful than that is having an advisor who works in the space, preferably one that does litigation funding themselves, because they have a level of knowledge that is going to save you critical time. And time 
time is the one thing that sometimes trustees don't have. You might have, and Michelle, I think, you know, you spoke to this, that you have a deadline, and, you know, either the court imposed it or you have a schedule of limitations, and you have to get funding and make a decision. So, uh, and expertise it really translates to uh, savings. Um, one thing that I uh, touched on earlier in our opening remarks, but we haven't really uh, addressed that I really would like us to talk about now is um, how has litigation funding changed since the early days and specifically what are the new products uh, that were new uh, types of transactions that litigation funders are engaging in? Uh, Matt, do you want to start with that? Because I know you're involved in some of these. Sure. So, so I, I think that um, uh, lit litigation funders have, you know, they face, as I said, they face significant competition. Pretty much anyone who could take litigation funding has has alternatives between contingent counsel and self funding and, and sales and claims. Uh, so people have had to come out with. Uh, well, sales and claims is, is a subset of litigation funding. Uh, uh, people had to develop products that are, are sensitive to this. I think uh, uh, first and foremost is, is risk sharing. Uh, people have gotten a lot more savvy about, instead of just uh, of, of understanding how risk sharing works between and among the, the funder, the lawyer, and the plaintiff, or in the very cases defendant, um, so, so we see term sheets come to us with a lot of variation in, in risk sharing um, and uh, really typically designed to align incentives uh, to deal with a fundamental challenge that, that the plaintiff controls the settlement of the action, but certain forms of settlements can be, can produce, as Connor was saying, a low net recovery to the plaintiff or a, an insufficient return to the funder. But, for ethical reasons, the, the contracts often can't shift control or create approval of settlements. So people are thinking very creatively about that, designed to reduce the risk of a settlement that uh, that, that doesn't work for one of the, the constituent parties. Um, second, I think people will become very thoughtful about how to manage the incentives for attorneys, and I think every litigation funder has a different view of, of how attorneys are properly incentivized. Um, you want attorneys to have, and, and let's just think about it on a simple level is, if you want an attorney to share risk and have back end, what's the discount from their standard hourly rates that you are, you are supposed to ask them to give up? And how does that change your available attorneys? Um, and, and I think different people have different thoughts there. And we see very, very strong uh, disparities uh, among term sheets based on that. I think another thing that's very important is that the contingent lawyers have recognized that pure contingent deals at 30 and 40 percent are, are by far the most expensive way you can fund litigation. And, and, and if you say that the only I'm only going to be hired as a contingent attorney at 40 percent or I won't take this case, a lot of people can turn to Connor or turn to his competitors and say, okay, fine, well, I'll go without you because I, I need to have a lower all-in expected cost of litigation on this case that might bring in 40, 50, 100 million dollars. And we are now seeing law firms that were traditionally 100% contingent in this world getting flexible, developing hourly rates and developing ways that they can engage the fact that, that good, interesting lawsuits Will tend to flow to litigation funding and away from pure contingency because it's a higher expected value for the plaintiff. And, and I would say, you know, this is a conversation I've had over dinner with, with many law firms, great law firms that like to do things 100% contingently. Three years ago, they would say, no way. Like, like we don't do, we, we keep timesheets, but just for bellwether applications. You know, we make, my job is to make $10,000 an hour. You know, I, I don't care about any of this stuff. They're, they now have complete kind of market, you know, tested um, uh, hourly rates and they're willing to engage in this process. And, and I think that's been a great development because it has kept some of these law firms, which are great firms, 
in the hunt for good cases. So when I am thinking about who to hire as a law firm and how to fund their work, I now have all of those choices in front of me. Um, I also think that you know, clearly litigation uh, uh, is, and people are now more comfortable with it as an asset, which means it can flow into other kinds of asset-based financing. Um, I think we now uh, are able to get litigation causes of action in the borrowing basis for certain kinds of you know, direct lending product. Uh, I don't think banks are yet able to really underwrite in a serious way. But as you've heard in the earlier panel, uh, the newer breed of direct lenders are willing to come in and think about that as a certain level of haircut. And, and at some level, that's actually creating some ability to use litigation as, as, as recourse financing together with your receivables and your real estate. And, and that is definitely something we wouldn't have seen you know, two or three years ago, to say at least four or five years ago. Now that would be a real part of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent point um, where, you know, litigation funders relative to um, contingency lawyers um, or even insurance products that are out there do not, are not in the business of putting money out. Nobody likes to write checks for expenses. Um, more and more people are coming to us for funding, but also with like some OPEX on top of that or some sort of liquidity. And, and you know, lawyers are not in that business, and that's, that's a big part of what we do um, as well. And then just, to, just to, um, to go further in terms of the development of what sort of products um, you know, are, we, are we investing in? You know, I, I talked a little bit about the evolution of the business by starting you know, directly with lawyers and law firms and their clients um, covering you know, what is for many an owner's expense um, for fees and expenses to bring up to Ripley's litigation. Um, that um, that has, has evolved into a law firm portfolio financing where you know, the firm itself will put a portfolio facility, facility in place. And even with you know, contingency lawyers, we have portfolios where it's just a, a, an expense-only portfolio. We'll, we'll cover expenses across all their cases. Um, and then that kind of evolved from uh, for us to go back directly and start over talking to corporations, general counsels, CFOs, treasurers, and the like about their litigation and their litigation assets. Um, you know what it means. You know their accounting for litigation, um, liquidity, etc. And you know more and more the trend line is doing deals directly with corporations. Um, and then that evolved into monetization of claims, which is accelerating the value of those litigation assets into today's dollars. Um, there's been a fair amount of press over the last several months of, of uh, at least one large monetization deal we did in the food and trust space. Um, and that is you know, a big trend line um, for us, and it allows us to move you know, a lot of money in a single transaction. Um, and then beyond that, um, we've talked a little bit about purchasing claims outright, outright to the extent that they're assignable. Um, and then, you know, and like I said, this, this business is evolving and changing, you know, almost weekly. And things that we're looking at right now are, you know, more derivative type of type investments where we're not investing in the in the underlying litigation itself, um, but but something that's that whose value is attached to. The outcome of that underlying litigation, whether that but might be, you know, buying, you know, equity in a company or, or their bonds or what have you. Um, you know, we've had companies in distress approach us about um, a particular piece of litigation that they are, you know, have a judgment against them. They're judgment debtor. It's on appeal. They need to raise capital. How can we help them? And we look at, at those types of investments uh, more and more, which are very, very.
spoken about publicly. Um, it's, it's on appeal. Um, the collection has been stayed um, until I think a hearing on the 5th of December. Um, um, you know, I'm sure everybody knows what we're alluding to. It's the YPF assets that we purchased out of bankruptcy many, many years ago um, that we um, prevailed in the Southern District of New York uh, on, merit, on, on, the, uh, on the merits and damages this past summer. It's a big number. Um, we have uh, you know, began to you know, formulate our, our approach to collection, and we haven't discussed that publicly either, but that's where we are, we're pleased with the result. Um, and you know, we're, we're, you know, we, we're, we still have a, a ways to go, but we're, we're confident in, in, in our Well, uh, we're, we're extraordinarily happy about, in the judge's opinion, the footnote that was about Burford Capital's involvement and having really no bearing on the, you know, on the economics or the, the underlying decision in the case, whether, whether funding was there or not, that case was, you know, in and of itself, you know, on its own track. And, and the other side really tried to make a big deal about our involvement. Used it to you know, kind of uh, as, a, as a bit of a sideshow, frankly. Um, as far as collection is concerned, it's no, no surprises thus far. One last question. Are you happy with the change in the government? I'm sorry? Are you happy with the new president? Oh, yeah, I, I thought that question came up too. Um, I, you know, I think a regime, a regime change in Argentina is, is probably great for most everybody, so I think on balance it's a positive. There's a lot of unknowns there. That's a good question. Any other questions? Uh, how much does the influence of the funder have in, in a competitive term sheet on any of the litigation? I mean, we'll fund it, but we think it should hit that direction of litigation. Is, is that a conflict or is that part of the process? Can I, um, can I address that? Um, this comes up a lot, and the way I view it as counsel is that the funder gets those inputs and has a handle on the directionality of the case and where the counsel is likely to take the case when they do their due diligence. Once they, and they make a decision to invest based on that, and once the case is funded, um, they, uh, that's kind of it. I mean, that, that's a matter between the client and the counsel. Um, I, uh, I can only rest speak to the situation where the funding is made directly to the client as opposed to where the funding is to the law firm. Um, I, you know, I think that's a, you know, a different model. Um, but I think where the rubber hits the road is on the issues where there's a disagreement as to whether a case should settle. And the modern approach to that is to, I think Matt alluded to this, is to try to balance uh, the consideration of different views, maybe have advice, advice and consult, but to have a tiebreaker mechanism. And that's easier in the bankruptcy context, frankly, because you always have the avenue of going to the bankruptcy court. Um, Maybe not so easy in a, a non-bankruptcy context, so not, that might be out of my realm. I, um, I would answer it just a little bit differently if I could. Um, look, litigation goes not in a straight line, right? There's lots of ups and downs, and once you go to trial, you know, all bets are off. Um, we don't control, we are passive investors, but however, we are often asked um, about a particular argument. Uh, would, you know, would you, would you uh, Proof of brief. Well, we are our, our committee, committee members are have and more than willing to, to move arguments. Um, you know, our, the way these um, these arrangements are are papered is such that interests are aligned between us and the law firms and the claimant, and we all want to do well in the litigation. And if things are going sideways or south, and there's an opportunity for the you know the three parties to collectively get together and write the ship. We're all for it, but we don't sit there and you know pick up the phone and say, "Hey, what are you doing? Here's how we here's how it needs to go." But 
but when, when asked, we will we will we will we will offer our, our thoughts. So we have two solutions for uh, investors who need to exercise subsequent control over the, the conduct of some of the litigation, and that's generally not going to be professional litigation investors who sort of are chartered not to do that, uh, but but just a regular way investor who is not chartered. And there's two solutions. The first is to set up the litigation funding as effectively a multiple for all facility where the funder has discretion to refuse runs. And therefore, they control the checkbook. And if you change strategy, then the money stops coming. Um, and that's a very effective way uh, to do it. And then the second thing is simply to take the litigation and either have it already be or make it through a carve out or a spin off the sole asset of, of, of a business company. And then you put the you put the investor on the board of directors of that entity, and so while and that, that funding is effectively now non-recourse, it's corporate funding of all the assets of the company. So there's no problem with the investor being on the board and deciding what happens. It just happens to be that the sole or the sole primary asset of that company is the litigation, and then you're sitting directing the litigation as an investor, in the, but but not having something that looks problematic from the perspective of legal ethics or the attorneys because it's it's not a non-recourse litigation funding, it's a recourse funding of a business entity, the sole asset of which is litigation. And so either of those two approaches works quite nicely, but 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 the professional full-time litigation investors generally don't want either one because of their charter constraints against control of litigation. Uh, so I um getting signals that our time is up. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for coming to our